Welcome back to another episode of the Lender Podcast. My name is Bryce. I'm your host. And today we're talking about some of the top mistakes that I made and also that I've seen other lenders make as either a a new or kind of less experienced hard money lender. And these are things that I wish somebody else had taught me or explained to me or just that I think other lenders should know about, which some of these are for the most part common knowledge, but others are, are a little bit less common. So Um, Before we jump into the episode, I do want to share today's uh, sponsor, which is Lender. Lender is a hard and private money lending uh, origination and servicing tool. So many lenders use Excel, which in my opinion, is not the greatest tool. It's kind of the natural like first step in your progression. But as you grow and you scale, you really should check out a, a more robust automated software solution to manage all of your loans, all of your investors, all of your borrowers, all the collateral, just all the due diligence steps and the paperwork and the entity documents, just everything all all, all in one spot so that you know that you don't miss anything. So when I started, I too used Excel and I just, I grew out of it really quickly and learned that there's definitely a better way. So we use Lender in our own business. It's worked out great for us. And I think you should definitely check it out. You can check that out by going to join lender, L E N D R.com join lender.com and get started. Okay, so let's let's jump into the number one newbie mistake that I see. And these these are not in any particular order necessarily, but the number one thing that I, I see is basically inadequate due diligence. Most lenders, unless you've been in the real estate world for a long time, they're excited to do their first deal. And so, you know, really, really quickly they just say, Okay, yep, let's wire the funds, do the docs, and like we'll we'll be good to go. I guess it depends on just kind of your nature as an investor. Personally, I'm I'm definitely less risk averse than a lot of people are. And so I'm a little bit more willing to just jump in and say, okay, let's do this. Let's go. Because I, I think sometimes investing does love speed with, you know, I'm putting a little asterisk there because I don't, I don't know that that's always the case, but sometimes investing does love speed. There are some opportunities that you do want to jump in relatively quick hard money lending is is not that way. These deals that come along, they're a dime a dozen. And I heard a quote once that said, the deal of a lifetime comes around about twice a year. And I, <laughs> I love that because it's so true. People think that these opportunities are never going to come around again. And it's just, it's just not true. And so it's, it's definitely okay to pass on a deal or be a little bit more conservative or just take a little bit longer with your due diligence. So let's, let's make sure that we look at all of the numbers. We look at all of the comps. We make sure that our LTV, our loan to value, our loan to ARV looks good. Our loan to cost looks good. You know, just all the basic like check mark metrics. We want to make sure that everything looks good. Like when you're, when you're putting your funds on the line, not to mention in investor's capital on the line, you want to be extremely careful with the due diligence, all of your underwriting. And yes, one of the great things about hard money is there is an element of speed, you know, so typically we can underwrite a deal in a day or, you know, an hour or whatever it is. And then we can typically fund, you know, the same day or the next day or whatever it is, as long as all the title work is completed. And so I, I think because that's one of the pros of the business, sometimes people get a little bit too aggressive and too fast and just say, wire, 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 you know, send a wire and you know, we're, we're done, check it off next. I, I think, I think that's where you get into trouble. Another thing that I see very common is overvaluing the collateral. So a lot of lenders will just take the borrower's numbers at face value. And more often than not, I see that borrowers are definitely inflating their numbers. And I don't know if they're like trying to be intentionally malicious, but I I think a lot of borrowers are overly optimistic on the ARV and the market conditions, and they think it's going to be a great flip. And sometimes that is the case. And two, three years ago, that was the case. You could pretty much buy anything. And by the time you were completing that project, you've held on it for three, four months. And it's actually, you know, it sells for over asking or way more than, than you thought it would. And I don't know that we're there anymore. Typically I like to take anywhere from five to 7% of the borrowers value, whatever they say it is, and, and take that off the top, just because I find that it gives you a little bit more realistic number as to, to what, what it really is. And along with that too, everybody knows that like, so I, I, for example, I collect comps from from the borrowers. I say, hey, what, what makes you think that this is what your ARV is going to be? What makes the property worth this right now? And again, it I, I don't think it's malicious, but I just think that borrowers are most of the time a little bit more optimistic. And those comps are are pretty easy to find 
whatever you want. You know, you say you want this property to sell for $400,000. You can typically find a comp that, you know, something in a similar price range, similar neighborhood, similar size, square footage, similar style, ranch home or whatever it is sold for $400,000. Not necessarily. So always do your due diligence and just make sure that you look at your own comps and not just the borrower's comps. I also see a lot of uh, borrowers who are overly optimistic on the current market conditions. And this this is your job as a lender to kind of like, I, someone once once told me like, you're, you're a steward of capital. You know, like I, I think of a, you know, a bodyguard or, you know, a knight in shining armor. And he's, you know, he's got his, his whole suit here and he's all decked out. And, and someone just said like, you're a steward of capital. And I really liked how that resonated. Um, just because I, that's how I do look at it. When, when an investor comes to me and, and is trusting me with their funds, it's my job to guard that capital. And I would feel so much more terrible <laughs> If I were to have lost an investor's money over my own, obviously I don't want to lose my own capital, but I will do everything in my power to not lose investor capital. And going going along with that, I think being overly optimistic on market conditions is is something that we see all too often. There's there's a lot of these institutional investors that uh, when COVID came around, they just stopped lending altogether. And I think if you're an optimistic investor, you're like, why, why did they do that? Like there's still plenty of deals to be found. And I honestly, I think that was really smart of them. Like when you see a change in the market, you can, you could protect a lot of capital by just pumping the brakes a little bit. Like, let's say maybe let's, let's not stop lending entirely, but let's, let's not do 75% LTV. Let's, let's maybe do 65%. And if that means that we can't lend to some of the, the traditional borrowers that we've lent to in the past, then so be it, you know, because it is your job to guard that capital. So uh, one one great thing about being a lender is you do get a pulse on the market just because you you have outstanding loans. And so you can see, uh, you know, are, are things churning really quickly or, or are loans taking a little bit longer to pay off? And so if you do have loans that are not paying off as quickly, maybe you say, okay, well, I don't know. I think the market might be pulling back just a little bit. Let's let's pull back on our, our guidelines and our you know our, our requirements to lend and, and all these other things just so that you can guard that capital more closely. Another thing that I see is uh, lenders will take the borrower's exit strategy at, at face value. And pretty much every single loan application that we receive the, you know, on, on, we have a a field that says, you know, what's your exit strategy. And people just say like, sell or refi, sell or refinance. And like, okay, cool. That's, that's the, the de facto answer, but let's, let's dive into this a little bit deeper and like, let's, let's see, okay, what happens if you can't sell or you can't refinance? And people are like, well, you know, what are the, what other exit strategies are there? Like, there's a, there's a couple other things that we need to, to look at. So for example, look, look at the borrower's uh, credit score. Uh, there's a lot of people who say, well, we're hard money lenders. We don't look at credit score. I think that's bullshit. I think that's the dumbest thing you can do. We absolutely look at, at the credit score because if a borrower can't manage their household finances, what makes you think that they're going to be able to manage a project with you? And so if, if they don't have a good credit score, what makes you think they're going to be able to refinance this property with you? Yeah, there might be a good spread on the numbers, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything if they don't have a, a great exit strategy or a, a lot of people will say, okay, well, if I can't sell it, I'll just, I'll just rent it. Well, no, that doesn't really work either because how are you going to pay me off? Like most of the time, hard money lenders are in the business of short-term loans. So we can turn that capital faster and faster. And renting is not going to be a good strategy because we're not going to allow you to have this loan for longer than a year. And on top of that, most of the time, the monthly interest payments will grow and accrue faster than the rent. So it just, it doesn't make sense. So all that to say that selling is a great strategy and that's most of the time the correct strategy. Um, but I just typically like to look and see, okay, do they have one or two or maybe even three different exit strategies if if you can't sell this property? Do they have cash to be able to pay this off? Do they have a HELOC or uh, you know a, a, maybe a, another private investor who they can JV with to, to get out of this loan? And so I just just a little bit more encouragement to dive into their exit strategy, kind of like poke and prod a little bit and be like, okay, what, what happens if this doesn't pan out and how are we going to get our money back? Another big one that I see all the time is, is when uh, lenders will lend to a borrower and they're using it for a primary residence or a secondary home. So under no circumstances, can you lend to a 
borrower who is looking to use this as a primary residence or like a vacation home or a second home. And the main reason is because you run into the, the TILA or the, the RESPA different acts. So there's TILA, RESPA, um, just these different, different acts that um, have certain protections around primary housing and you just don't want to deal with it. You just, you don't want to like, you know, luckily we, we knew enough to know that we're, you know, we're not going to do that, but there's different, different issues with say, like you do offer a loan on a primary residence, the foreclosure rules and eviction and different things like that gets a little tricky. And it's just something that you don't want to don't want to deal with. So um, we only, only, only lend on investment properties. And I highly recommend that you only do the same. Uh, capital reserves. Capital reserves are a big one because I can't think of a single project that has ever been completed under budget and under the allotted time. They always go over and they always cost more. And typically it's not like five to 10% more. Like most cases I see it 20, 25% more than, than anticipated. And, and I'd, I'd even say that for myself, we're pretty conservative when it comes to estimating numbers. Like when we were flipping houses, we would add, you know, an additional 10 grand, 12 grand, 15 grand, just for some additional padding. And a lot of people are like, wow, that's kind of a lot. And we're like, yeah, we just really wanted to make sure that like we had the cash and everything was just, you know, broken down by line. And we had kind of a little buffer, but I truly cannot think of a single case where we didn't go over that buffer and then some maybe twice with over 70 flips that we had like it was it was very rare so all that to say when you're when you're looking at your your borrowers cash reserves just make sure that they've got significant cash set aside in a you know high yield savings account or whatever it may be a line of credit so that when not if when things do go over budget they've got enough of a buffer enough of a cushion to make sure that they can finish the renovation get the property on the market sell it and pay you back the last thing that I see happen all the time is inadequate legal docs. So a lot of people will just find some some basic like just rocket lawyer docs or whatever it may be, um, and they're like, okay, this looks good and sufficient. Always, 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 always have your docs checked by uh, a real estate attorney, and not necessarily someone who's just a real estate attorney, somebody who is specifically familiar with the lending laws and regulations where you live. Um, you know, if, if you don't know of anybody or don't have somebody close around you who is like really good in the lending space, um, I highly recommend Jirasi law. Um, I believe they're out of Chicago, but their, their entire business model. And, and again, they're not sponsored or affiliated or anything like this, but we've just worked with them in the past and, and they've been great. Um, they are specifically targeted and only working in the private and hard money lending space. And so if you need, uh, docs, they're a great resource to just review and check everything and make sure that it's it's legal and binding in your specific state as well. Um, as far as our docs go, we're you know it's it's pretty run of the mill. So um, I, I lend in Idaho, so we have we have our deed of trust. We also have a personal guarantee to make sure that if. Uh, you know, if a, a borrower can't perform, we can also go after their their personal assets. They're personally guaranteeing this property. We also have a high cost loan disclosure uh, with a, with a flag in there that says like this is for commercial purpose. So it just just goes to show that like the borrower has agreed that yes, this this is going to be a high cost loan, and I'm I'm entering into that for a reason. And then we also have um, a balloon payment disclosure, just saying like, look, this is a very short term loan, either six or twelve months, whatever it is. And you expect to pay it off in full within that time frame. So those those are some some basics. Like you can do a couple of things, like uh, use of funds affidavits. That's probably another episode that we can talk about later. But just make sure that your your docs are always double checked by an attorney or Jirasi or whoever it may be, because so many people will just use these docs, run of the mill, and just like reuse them over and over and over and over again, and not not have them updated or revised or or checked at least periodically. It just it's it's so worth it to make sure that everything is binding and that, you know, in the event of a default or whatever it may be, you're protected and you can actually take this property back. So that is it for today's episode. Hopefully you learned a thing or two about some of the, the top mistakes that I wish I didn't make when I was when I was just starting out. Again, like I said, some of these I didn't necessarily make, but I, I wish somebody had uh, taught me or you know whatever whatever it may be. So um, let me know if there's anything that I, I missed out that you wish someone had taught you when you were just starting out. Um, but until next week, we'll chat with you then.